I'd like to propose examining that topic from three angles, looking around, looking back, and looking forward. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for that very kind introduction. When you get to be an old person, you have a long biography. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I, I have to begin by expressing great appreciation to the co-sponsors of this conference, Kai Haji Yaya Cholil Shakuf and Sheikh Mohammed Al Isa, a conference that is first of its kind, and I believe that it's not too soon to say that this is a landmark for the G20 to recognize the role of religion in geopolitical discourse. In fact, someday we might look back on this as a historic event, a kind of turning point that will always be associated with Indonesia and the philosophy of Pancasila. Not surprisingly, like any new idea, the idea of an R20 summit has caused a certain amount of puzzlement in some quarters. And so we hear questions like these. What's religion got to do with the aims of the G20 for global economic stability and sustainable growth? Or how can religion foster stability when it's so often been a divisive element? Or how can we even talk about shared values when there is so much cultural and religious diversity in the world? And all of those kinds of questions will be very much in the background of our panel's discussion today. Difficult topics are ahead of us. How to deal with historical grievances? How can universal principles be reconciled with cultural diversity? And how can one assure that religion will be a source of social harmony rather than a source of problems in years to come? Now, since I've been asked to offer a few thoughts about the challenge of identifying shared values, I'd like to propose examining that topic from three angles, looking around, looking back, and looking forward. And by looking around, I simply mean trying to take stock of the obstacles that confront any effort to identify and affirm shared values. By looking back, I mean asking if there's anything that we might learn from a similar effort that was undertaken 75 years ago in the early days of the United Nations. And by thinking, looking ahead, I mean asking ourselves what religious leaders and scholars can do to help assure that religion will help promote human flourishing rather than division and conflict. So when we look around, we don't have to look far to see that one of the greatest challenges ahead is the belief of many people, including many very influential people, that religion is outdated, obsolete, irrelevant, and even an obstacle to peace and social stability. What can we say to people who hold those beliefs? Of course, what we can say depends very much on what our interlocutor is able or willing to hear, but I would like to suggest that one way to get the attention of at least some international policymakers might be to point out to them that every single one of the goals of the G20, every one of its aspirations, is currently threatened by a grave environmental crisis. And no, I do not mean the well-known threats to our natural habitat. I'm speaking of another crisis that is less well-recognized and entirely man-made. I'm speaking of a crisis in our social environments. And the signs of that crisis are all around us. They're in the fraying of the intricate webs of customs and understandings on which the success of every program, every policy ultimately depends. 
They're in the deterioration of the small structures of civil society where those customs and understandings are formed. And those small structures, families, schools, religious groups, other kinds of groups, those structures are the seedbeds, the nurseries of the qualities of character and competence that every healthy society requires in its citizens and statespersons. And it's at that very basic level that the world's great culture-forming religions have a vital role to play. Of particular relevance to the goals of the G20 is the fact that globalization, along with its many benefits, including bringing people closer together, globalization also has powerful effects on those little social environments. In fact, globalization has the potential to uproot cultures at a pace never seen before. As one longtime observer has pointed out, you can't build an emerging society if you are simultaneously destroying the cultural foundations that cement that society and give it the confidence and cohesion that it needs in order to confront and act properly with the world. And without a sustainable culture, there can be no sustainable globalization. Now, if that's correct, and I believe it is, it's hard to see how the benefits of globalization can be max maximized without taking religion seriously. But in most discussions of international policy, we hear a great deal about the negative effects of religion and very little about the ways, the important ways in which the world's religions have contributed to the maintenance of healthy societies and cultures. Of course, religion isn't the only element to be considered, but it is such a major force that one cannot simply ignore it. And that is why the G20 was wise to take religion seriously. As Pope Francis once put it, humanity has been too slow to recognize that social environments, like natural environments, are at risk and need protection. And that's why our first topic this afternoon, the quest for shared civilizational values, this topic has acquired new urgency in our increasingly interdependent and yet conflict-ridden world. Interestingly, the last time that a multinational group paid attention to this question of shared values was many years ago when the newly formed United Nations decided to respond to calls for some kind of international document involving human rights. And so as we approach the question of shared values today, it might be interesting to take just a brief look at what we might learn from that previous experience. Back then, the idea, this is right after World War II, the idea of Shared values was considered ridiculous by the self-styled realists of the day and by many prominent anthropologists who were more interested in the differences among people than in what makes us all part of a human family. But fortunately for posterity, the UN decided to go ahead anyway, and the result was a historic political achievement. It was the approval of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948 without a single dissenting vote. And the UN in those days was already impressively multicultural, although of course, imperfectly so, largely by uh, not yet including the many countries that were still under colonial rule and in the global south. At the time, though, the uh, commission that was assigned to draft the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was also impressively multicultural. And I'd just like to honor a few of the names of the leading members. China's Peng Chung Zhang was not only a gifted diplomat, but a respected educator and philosopher. India's Hansa Mehta was a pioneering feminist and social activist. And she was the one who pressed for equality between men and women in the Universal Declaration. Chile's Hernan Santa Cruz was a great advocate for the social and economic rights. Lebanon's Charles Malik at the time was the chief spokesman for the Arab League in the early UN. 
all through the Palestinian crisis. French jurist René Cassin put the stylistic touches on the document, and American Eleanor Roosevelt was the chairperson. Now, the declaration itself was not a legally binding document, but what made it a historic achievement was that it was an official consensus that some things are so terrible that no one, or virtually no one, will openly approve them or admit they approve them. And some things are so good that virtually no one will openly uh, oppose them or admit they oppose them. But today, that consensus is faltering. <sighs> Memories of the terrible wars of the early part of the 20th century are fading, and the ethnic strife, uh, strife and uh, conflicts that have followed regional and ethnic strife and conflicts have impaired the sense of a single human family. Some powerful countries are contesting the very idea of universal rights in the name of economics, national security, or economic necessity. Some Western groups are using the language of human rights to promote ideas that are not widely accepted in other parts of the world, and often not even in their own countries. The time seems right, therefore, for a new and even more broad-based effort to identify and affirm shared civilizational values. And as this R20 takes up that challenge, it might be helpful to recall two conclusions that were reached by the framers of the UDHR. One was that the number of principles that people of vastly different cultures will recognize as universal is relatively modest. Not everything can be a universal human right. And second, that universality of principles does not mean uniformity in their application. I think that is a point where it's a place where the world religions have something to teach international policymakers, especially the kind of policymakers that prefer top-down solutions to problems. The world's religions have always understood better than international policymakers, that a common set of principles can be brought to life, and indeed can only be brought to life, in different societies in a legitimate variety of ways, so long as no core principle is completely ignored. But here's the problem. It's one thing to identify shared principles, and quite another to bring those principles to life in concrete situations. And that's the real challenge which brings us to looking forward to the possible role of religions in promoting an international order grounded in shared civilizational values. There's no doubt that religious leaders will be essential to maximizing the beneficial effects of religion and countering its negative effects, but it must be admitted, and that's why we're all here at this particular session, it must be admitted that there are formidable obstacles to that effort. And one of them involves some business that a UN study group had to leave unfinished 75 years ago when this group of philosophers was asked to, by UNESCO to look into whether there really were any values that could be said to be universal. And they solicited the views of religious leaders and political figures around the world, and they reported Yes, there are some practical ideas about decent human conduct that are indeed widely shared. But then they added an important warning. They said, those practical ideas rest on principles that are somewhat different from place to place, different ideas about human nature and about nature itself. As one of the members of that UNESCO Commission, the French philosopher Jacques Maritain said, yes, we agree on the rights so long as no one asks us why. So there is the challenge. So if the quest for shared values is to advance be where, beyond where it was left back then, it will have to go beyond superficial agreement 
It will require each tradition to look deeply into its own foundations. And like any other process of excavation, uh, when you dig things up, sometimes there are uncomfortable discoveries. But that exercise can also lead to a fresh appreciation of deep truths that have long been obscured. Plato in the Republic gives us a wonderful analogy of a statue of the sea god Glaucus that was in the ocean for many years and when they dredged it up it was all crusted with shells and covered with seaweed and it was only when all that debris was cleared away that you could see, as Plato tells us, the true and lasting features of the god. Now, something like that was experienced by the United States Commission on Unalienable Rights when we were asked in 2019 to see if the universal principles in the Universal Declaration could be grounded in our American political tradition. Our commission concluded that yes, that was possible, but along the way, we had to confront some very uncomfortable, troubling aspects of our own country's history. And similarly, in the Roman Catholic religion, as Pacquiao pointed out in his speech, uh, in the Roman Catholic religion, the Second Vatican Council had to confront historic injustices committed in the name of Christianity. Now, as if all those challenges weren't enough, here's another one for religious leaders and scholars. They will have to educate their followers to reject the use of religion as a pretext for violence. They'll have to reject ideologies that manipulate religion for political purposes. And much will depend on whether secularist leaders can free their followers from prejudice against religion and get them to accept that religious voices have a place in public deliberations. So all in all, I think we must admit that anyone who looks at our program for this R20 meeting would probably say it looks very ambitious. And that means that many people will probably dismiss it as unrealistic as many dismissed the post-World War II Human Rights Project as unrealistic at that time. Yet, that project proved that ideals are real, as real as earth and water. And it's worth remembering, thank you. It's worth remembering that the men and women who held those ideals were not naive in their idealism. They had lived through two world wars, severe economic crises, they had seen human beings at their best as well as at their worst, and they took encouragement from the fact that while human beings are capable of great evils, they are also capable of imagining that there are better ways to live. And they were capable of putting their ideals into declarations and constitutions. And they were capable of orienting their conduct toward the ideals that they themselves had embraced. There's a sculpture outside the UN building in uh, New York City. Perhaps some of you have seen this remarkable sculpture. sculpture. It captures something of that idealism tempered with realism. It's an enormous sphere of burnished bronze. It's beautiful. It suggests a globe. And, oh, there it is. <laughs> there it is. Uh, if you look back there, you'll see it. It's an enormous sphere of burnished bronze. It suggests a globe, but it's cracked. And it, it's, those imperfections cause the passerby to stop and wonder, is it cracked because it's defective? Is it cracked because of some terrible disaster? Or maybe it's cracked like an egg because something else has to emerge? And perhaps all of those things. But when you look into the cracks, you see that another brightly shining sphere is coming along, but that one is cracked too. Yet, uh, it, there's a tremendous sense of potency, of dynamism, and of emergent possibilities. So 
I will close with this thought. Years from now, people not yet born will form opinions about our stewardship of the legacy that was handed down to us by men and women who were striving to bring standards of right out of the ashes of terrible wrongs. And someday, people who come after us will pass judgment on whether we enhanced or sustained that fragile inheritance. So let's take heart from the knowledge that this R20 shows that there are still many women and men in the world who are determined to make ideals real again. Thank you.